title of the talk is going to be, they're inevitable. I mean, th this, is, this, is, this is inevitable in schools. The only interesting question is, we have, don't know how it's going to happen. Now, how many of you have seen um, uh, Shakespeare in Love? There's a movie called Shakespeare in Love, right? And there's oh, a guy, no. right? The, at the beginning of the movie, he, he runs the theater. And he says, things happen. And something just happened. Well, something's going to happen. And this, is this will happen. There's no question. But we're not quite sure how it's going to be. Ten years ago, we started with Palm Pilots. Because we believe then as we believe now that every kid is going to have a small, low-cost device connected in the, connected device in their hand. And the Palm Pilots were really kind of crude. I mean, oh, man. But now it's, you know, now we're on Androids. Androids. And it's beginning to catch on. Beginning but very nascent. Um, so with that sort of history, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about is sort of what are the problems to making this thing happen? And number, what are the problems for making this happen? And why ought it to happen? What benefit does this have to kids in classrooms? Because right now there's this um, wild flavor, wild energy to put iPads in classrooms. And you, you'll, you'll see it everywhere. And then you've got to ask the question, what problem does it solve? And we'll talk a little bit about that. So let's talk about the global situation, the context in which this will appear in schools. The global context is it's a mess. The world is a mess in the terms of money. There's just no money. And this is a wonderful quote from a gentleman named Jeffrey Imelt, who is the CEO of General Electric, he says, this economic crisis doesn't represent a cycle, it represents a reset. It's an emotional, social, economic, and educational reset that we're, we're suggesting, and we talk to superintendents and principals all the time, this is a time to change. Take this opportunity. Don't buy those textbooks. Do something different. And in schools, this is what it looks like on a regular basis, from the youngest all the way up to the oldest. <laughs> It, I mean, really, it's, it's absolutely depressing to go into schools and the kids are sitting there. We've got other pictures in classrooms where they're just bored to tears. There's nothing happening in the schools. And <laughs> the budgets are in the toilet. I mean, uh, whoops. There's no money. There really isn't any money. The levies aren't being passed. We were just talking yesterday in St. Mary's, Ohio. We've been working. There's a little community. It's, it's northwest of Columbus. And it's a, a small, semi-rural community. And uh, they have about 1,000 smartphones in the school. It's an amazing place. The, uh, the levy didn't pass. 20 per, it was 80 to 20. 20% 20 people voted for it. I mean, it's unbelievable. There's no money. They're going to have to cut $1 million every year for the next three years. You are living in California. You know the budgets here are getting in schools. So wait a minute. How is the school? supposed to get these or get the 21st century if they're cutting budgets. But then the technology. I love this one. Mary Meeker, who is a guru S, right, predicted that there would be a crossover, that there'd be more smartphones bought than PCs. She predicted it for 2012. I'm coming home to Google. It happened already. She said it was in 2012. It happened in 2010, last quarter of 2020. More of these things were bought than PCs. And that's, look how fast. That's the key. And they, they talk about the Android growth being 900%. I mean, this is a ridiculous, ridiculous person. There is no technology that's ever grown that fast. So this is what the children look like with technology. All you have to do is look around. From the older children, in Singapore, <laughs> we work in Singapore with the schools there. And the last time we were there, we took pictures of three-year-olds. Uh, these are well under three-year-olds, and every child has some form of technology in their hands most of the time. These are children in strollers. This, the little boy on the right is barely walking, but he still has technology in his hand. They can't read. <laughs> Remember, they can't read, but they're just going fine. They're just doing fine. They can't read. <laughs> the little boy on the left, this was at lunch one day, again, in Singapore. And he was having lunch with his mother, father, and grandmother. And he has a stylus in his left hand, and he's working madly on his phone. And every once in a while, his grandmother would say something to him. He would turn his head, open his mouth, she'd put food in it, and he would go back, back to what he was doing. It was, I mean, they had this system down. But in fact, these are the children. He was four. 
These are the children who are going to be coming into the schools. The children who have this much experience on this kind of technology are walking into the doors of the, of the schools on a regular basis, and it's only going to get worse, I mean, as far as the education system is going. As a matter of fact, he will grow up to be like these two gentlemen. These are aides to Hillary Clinton, and they're carrying with them their tool of choice. They don't have laptops under their arms. They've got their smartphone because they can do what they need to do on that device. He is a knowledge worker in training. My wife's a kindergarten teacher, and the, the, still the pencils and the crayons and the stuff, he doesn't want the, I mean, it's okay, but he doesn't want that. My wife brings in the leapfrog stuff because we have a bunch of that stuff. Those kids go right at it, absolutely. It's just technology. Well, what about fixing the schools? Here is a quote from Thomas Jefferson. Whenever people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. We're going through a tremendous upheaval in America right now. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of viciousness, right, in the public discourse. And it's if people are informed, they can they can rule themselves. But we I live in Ann Arbor. We got about eight percent dropout rate. Twenty miles down the road, we have eighty percent dropout rate in Detroit. Eighty percent of the kids don't finish high school. That's unbelievable in the U.S. I mean, I'm from Dallas. We've got 50% dropout rate in Dallas. In this Dallas public schools, 50% of the children do not graduate. 70% of the people in prison can't read. If you can't read, you're finished. You have no, there's nothing you can do. And here's a quote from a gentleman named Eli Broad. Now, he has some politics, and I don't want to get into that. But it's an amazing sort of observation. Public education is the key civil rights issue of the 21st century. Our nation's knowledge-based economy demands that we provide young people from all backgrounds and circumstances with the education and skills necessary to become knowledge workers. If we don't, we run the risk of creating an even larger gap between the middle class and the poor. This gap threatens our democracy, our society, and the economic future of America. Some of you know, most of you are, don't remember the 60s and when the, the ghettos burned, people were very, very angry. That can't happen again, it can't happen again. But if we don't do something about the schools, 80% of the kids, they're going to jail, right? That's what's happening. And they say it's about $36,000 to put a person in prison versus about you know seven, eight, nine, depends on how you count, kids uh, per, per year in, in school. Diane Ravitch, who again is politically very conservative, who was absolutely one of Bush's strongest supporters for national for NCLB, uh, No Child Left Behind, she in the last year has completely done a 180. She says the following, the evidence says that No Child Left Behind was a failure and charter schools are not going to be any better. It's dumbed down our curriculum, narrowed our curriculum. Our kids are being denied a full education because so much time is spent on test prep and on tests that are really not very good tests, et cetera. They're getting a worse education as a result of No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind is coming up for reauthorization in 2013. So a year and a half from now, something like a year and a half from now, this is going to come up. The Obama administration, Duncan, they're, they're even stronger. <laughs> I, and I, it hurts me to say it. They're even stronger in belief that the No Child Left Behind has to be reauthorized. But this is an amazing lady. She really is an amazing lady. And a lot, if you talk to the superintendents, they hate this stuff. They know it doesn't work. The teachers know it doesn't work. But somehow the politicians think it works. But this is how we're going to fix America's schools? I don't think so. So how are we going to fix America's schools? Well, right now, the emphasis is on teacher training, improving teacher quality. There are 38 <laughs> federally funded programs whose sole focus is improving teacher quality. At the University of Michigan, School of Ed, their total focus is on teachers, improving teacher quality. They think the technology is toys, and they talk like that, it's toys. Yeah. The Gates Foundation is putting hundreds of millions of dollars into merit pay for teachers. They think the way to do this is to get teachers and get the kids, uh, the teachers will do better in the classroom if you give them more money for if they, the kids do better. Tell us about how that works in school, if you're a teacher. <laughs> she was a teacher for 14 years. Merit pay in schools? 
Well, I mean, first of all, do I have the best and brightest to begin with? <laughs> or am I teaching a remedial course? And if I'm teaching a remedial course, I can only give the highest grade I can give my student is a C. Even if they're working at the best of their ability and they're really improving, because they're in a remedial course, they can only get a C. Otherwise, it's going to make them compete for um, the highest GPA with those students who are in the AP courses. So the whole system, you know, it's so silly. Ten years from now, after spending hundreds of millions of dollars, we'll find that this doesn't work. Remember what the Gates Foundation did a few years ago? Small classes. Now, it turns out, it does turn out, that small classes are better, but they gave up on it after spending hundreds of millions of dollars. They're going to spend the same thing. It's, it's not going to do one jot of difference. Now, what do we suggest? You know, we got we to gotta hammer everything's a nail. We think technology. <laughs> and, 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 and talking this morning, Technology is the enabler. All it, all it can do is enable a cultural change in the classroom. That's and the that's potential. what we're looking for, that's is a culture change in the classrooms. After spending billions of dollars, I mean, and we literally, the schools, if you look around, after spending billions of dollars on technology, labs and carts and so on, what has been the effect on student achievement? Pretty much zero. I mean, there's, there's not a lot that we can point to and say, wow, if we put in one more lab, it is really going to boost student achievement because we just haven't seen that. So part of the problem is this. Here is a lab and here's a cart. What we're seeing is supplementing the current pedagogical practices. When I came into the classroom, they said, or actually when technology came in, they said, what we want you to do is integrate technology into your classes. I said, oh, okay, I got it. Let's see. I need to find some computer activities that I could do. So every once in a while when I found one, I would take my students to the lab and let them do that. I integrated technology into the classroom. And that's what's happening is technology integration means supplement your existing pencil and paper technology, I mean curriculum, by adding a little technology to it. And it's used as an essential. I mean, not, I mean, as, not as an essential. You take supplements, and that's good. You know, vitamin supplements. But it's not the essential medication. It's, it's just that. It's a supplement. And that's the way technology has been treated, by and large, everywhere, as supplemental. OK, so they said, all right, it, rather than using carts and taking students to labs, what if we give every child a laptop? Give everyone their own device. Well, then we see headlines like this one in the New York Times that said, seeing no progress, some schools drop laptops because they were not seeing any change. But the article went on to say, well, there were three reasons why they were dropping it. The first one was there wasn't any educational software. They gave them what came on the device. I mean, they gave them an office suite. What else do you need <laughs> to really improve education? And there was no professional development. They taught the teachers how to use the computers, but not how to teach with them, how to incorporate, how do I change my classroom culture so that I'm really making use of the tool. And they found the model wasn't sustainable. Uh, I'm sorry, but we just cannot afford to keep giving, you know, buying these seven-pound laptops for students year after year after year. It was prohibitive, and not just the cost of the devices. It was the wiring, the networks that they needed to give the students the access. They didn't have people qualified to do it. Putting a Wi-Fi network, you guys talk about it and doing it, but putting a Wi-Fi network in a building where you have 30 people, then you have 30 people, then you have 30 people, and above them you have 30 people, I mean, and then they can all hit it at the same moment. How do you build a Wi-Fi system for that? It, you can do it. But it takes a lot of energy, and it takes a lot of money, and it takes a lot of savvy. That's not the core competency of schools. So their networks, they go to, they go to Best Buy, they buy a $69 Linksys router, and now they got Wi-Fi. That's right. We make the following prediction. Given all that, that technology doesn't work, we make the following prediction. Within five years, now it's four, because we've been doing this for a year, we believe that every student in every grade in every school in America We'll be using one of these devices 24-7. And we call them mobile learning devices because if you call it a cell phone, it raises a red flag to school boards and everybody else. But if you call it an MLD, then it just skates right on by. 
This is going to happen. It's 2015. It's going to happen. Now, the question is, is how is it going to happen? And the second question is, well, first of all, the first question is, why should it? What good does this do? And now we'll tell you about it. And then we'll talk about how we think it's going to happen. Uh, Mark Anderson, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with him, the Strategic News Service, made the prediction that in the future, there will be three form factors as far as technology. Traditional laptop, and then that category that he calls a carry-along. That's netbooks, pads, slates, tablets, and so on. It's smaller than a laptop, but you still have to consciously carry it. And then that which we have with us all the time, that which is mobile, that fits into your pocket. My doormat says it all. You never leave home without <laughs> keys, wallet, and mobile phone. That's it. That's all I need to take with me. And pretty soon, I may not even need the first two. I'll be able to do everything with my mobile device. All right. We're going to tell you a story now of two different schools, one from Nanshao Primary School in Singapore and one from Wegar, Michigan, another middle school. Now, we've made up the names, okay? But they're good names. But we're going to tell you these two stories of these two schools. First, first we'll start with, with uh, Nan Chow. Okay. Oh, that other, yeah. No, mm. let's get then I'm going to come back. Okay. All right. Nan, Nan Chow is a Chinese language school, and um, it's a primary school. And what we did there was give the children uh, technology that was learner center design. Every profession, whether it be an accountant, whether it be a travel agent, an investment banker, at 9 o'clock in the morning, they log into a layer of software and they live in that layer of software all day because that software helps them do their profession better. Sabre is, would be the reservation system, QuickBooks for your accountants. Um, uh, if you're a journalist, you have another kind of software system. Every single profession has a layer of software except one, K-12. Teachers and students, you give them a browser, you give them a concept mapping tool that is called Inspiration, and concept maps are nodes and arcs. You give them a browser, you give them a word processor, you give them a concept mapper, you say, go with God. That's it. Those your tools. Not good enough for the 21st century. Okay, so at Nan Chow, uh, we gave the children a what we called the mobile learning environment. And they were using, in this case, they were using Windows mobile phones because this was a couple of years ago. But we gave them a suite where it was mostly creation. The children were creating on the devices as opposed to simply consuming information. And each of the little tiles on the phone represents either a resource that the teacher gave them, it might be a website that was cached, it may be instructions, it may be rubrics, and so on, or it was a learning activity that the children did. And up in the upper left corner, there is uh, some instructions, and it talks about identify and explain what is a system. This particular one was on the plant system that we, we copied. These are third graders, by yeah, the way. that's right. Third I forgot graders. To tell you. These are three, third graders who got smartphones 24-7. Below that is a concept map, because they are showing the relationship between all the parts of the plant. Down below that is a drawing and animation, because the words and the pictures together. Draw me the picture, but explain to me what the process is. How does the plant grow? And then document it. They're going out and they're taking pictures of, they've got cameras on here, and incorporate the pictures of the roots and the stem and the petals, and so on. Show me that you understand, that you can connect the real world to what we're doing here. And then there's a, an Excel spreadsheet where they, again, it's another way of laying out each of those, defining what its role is in the plant system. On the top is KWL. This is what I, uh, what, this is what I know. This is what I wonder. And then finally, this is what I've learned. And then at the top, there's a video of an experiment they did. They were, they were showing how um, a plant absorbs the water, absorbs the food. So they put red food coloring, and they put celery in it, and they watched the celery turn red as it absorbed the food, the, the water that was in there. And this is just a sampling of the activities. They did a whole series. They, did, they used some Web 2.0 tools. They, they did some blogging. Wow. Uh, they did some polling in the class about, what do you think is going to happen? Let's see. So they used other things that were available. But it was a sampling of things. So there was a, a wealth, and in some cases, the teachers will say, create. You know, you're my accelerated learner, so what I want you to do is create two more activities. Do two more things that are related to this. 
the, on the upper right, the KWL, in Singapore, they have a master plan for three year, uh, a five-year master plan. They're in the third master plan. And they're trying to foster two kinds of 21st century skills, collaborative learning, teamwork, and what they call self-directed learning, solo work. And if you look at the KWL, it really is all about solo work, about, well, how do I know what to do next? What am I going to work on? And what this environment, the whole environment does, is it gives the kids a way to say, okay, I know this, but I want to know that, and I'm going to do these activities. All of those activities, as Kathy said, it's all on this one little device. Not on a computer that's big and screen, but this little device. All that they do on this. And I needed to back up a little bit. They, it, at Nan Chow, they gave us one classroom <laughs> um, because test scores are very important. Their position in the world on the test scores is extremely important to them. So it was, um, you can have one classroom and then we'll have five control groups and we're going to give you the medium kids as opposed to the accelerated students because we really don't want you mucking with them. <laughs> and so they let us do a two year longitudinal study where these children use these devices as opposed to the, what the control groups were doing. Traditionally in the school system, the teachers come in and they give them worksheets in science and third grade is the first year they get science. They give them a worksheet in the other classrooms and then they give them the answers to the worksheet. The students all spell them and listen and they write them down lest there be any ambiguity or any incorrect answers and then they memorize the, the worksheets. And the teacher that they gave us had no science skills and she had terrible classroom management skills. I mean that was the first hurdle to overcome was getting her. Now, we had two graduate assistants because we worked with the team at Nanyang Technological University. So we had assistants on the ground, in the school every day, helping teachers create lessons that had activities where the children actually did some science as opposed to just doing worksheets. Memorizing. Memorizing. This is what it looks like. I mean, that's what it looked like in the classroom. Yes, they've got pencils, they've got papers, they've got other things, but the classroom was alive every single day. The administrators were 100% committed to this. I mean, they said they'd do it, and when they said they'd do it, they gave us backup. It was an inquiry based. It was student-centric, again, because the students were actively involved all the time. And they used those mobile learning devices 40 to 70% of every school day. So when they're not working with each other or talking to the teacher or looking for assistance, they were using their devices. And by the way, they also take them home. And what they found was that the kids, because many of them didn't have internet at home, they became the center of the family where the parents would ask questions and the kids would, these are third graders, go on the internet and find answers for their mother, for their father. And they found that the kids were doing their science homework at home on these little devices. So. What happened as a result of that? Well, at Nan Chow, as we said, we had one class and there were five control groups. And that one class, even though they couldn't cover all of the curriculum because they were doing so many things as opposed to just worksheets, they still significantly outscored all five control groups. A standardized national test. That's right, on their standardized Singaporean test. Same test everyone tells. Not only did their science come up, but they also topped everyone in English because there was so much reading in English and communicating in English that their English scores also topped out. Now, there was no change in their math, but there was no focus. They did not use their devices in their math at all. They only used it in science, and the English was a, a, kind of an add-on. Other schools in the U.S. that are using mobile learning devices have reported improvements like this. This is St. Mary's of Ohio. This is rural. Again, these are places where they don't have broadband. Uh, pencil and paper students reading and math from fourth grade to fifth grade. Okay, so they increased 15%, 42%. But with students who are using the technology all the time, came up 46% and 71%. Texas, we got the same kind of scores. And Toms River, New Jersey, 150 sixth graders. And at the end of the school year, teachers said every single child turned in every piece of homework on time. <laughs> something that had never happened before, and it was because 
they were doing it on a device like this that fit into their pocket. So wherever they were, they could pull it out and work on homework and just submit it. Again, because they had cellular devices. Tell the, 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 the football story. Oh, there was uh, one of the fathers, because uh, we were saying, well, how is this happening? And the teacher was saying, well, it just happened everywhere. You know, we got reports from parents. One parent said he was taking his son and a friend to a Giants game. Two boys were in the back seat. He said, got really quiet. He said, okay, fellas, what are you doing? And they said, homework. <laughs> they both had their phones out, and they were doing their homework. On the way to the football game on Sunday. Yeah, well, They're doing their homework. <laughs> but they could. And the magic, as far as the scores, is nothing more than time on task. When you spend more time doing these things, it, it's amazing how your level uh, goes up, your achievement level. It's just because they're spending time and they like what they're doing. Now, you got to go one more level deeper. They are spending more time doing their homework on these devices. So you got to ask the question, why are they spending more time doing basically the same sorts of homework that they would do on paper and pencil, they're doing it on this. Here is a, a way to think about it. We were in Saratoga Springs, New York, we were rolling out a one-to-one, -one, and we were working with the telco provider. And they introduced, the day they introduced the devices, at the end of the period, this one young lad actually hugged the telco representative and said, this is the way schools should be. Now, telco representatives are not used to getting hugged by their customers. Now, in Detroit, outside of Detroit, there's a Lutheran high school, and they're doing this too. This is a high school, okay? They're all, the kids all have smartphones. It's interesting talking to the kids as they use the mobile learning environment, the same thing that you saw the P3 kids using. They seem to think that using it is really helping to fix the information in their minds. That's what we want. That's a teacher talking about why she sees the kids actually spending more time and being more effective. Finally, Kathy and I were at a, a training where we had about 100 IT directors. This was uh, also in New York, uh, uh, Glenn, Glenn, Watkins, Watkins Glen. Watkins Glen, New York. And there was about 100 IT directors. And after the and we had these kids, these sixth graders, helping the IT directors using their smartphones, right? And at the end of the hour, this young lad tugged at the leader's arm and said, can I say something? Sure. So he gets up in front of a hundred strangers and he says the following. I want to thank all of the adults here for bringing smartphones into our school and giving us this opportunity to help us learn. I mean, there wasn't a dry eye in the house, right? I mean, how, what kind of courage did this kid have to be able to get up and say this. And what did the teacher say about this kid? Oh, he, he, that he was an example of the have-nots. This was the child who didn't have, you know, an Xbox and all of the other, a PlayStation and all of the other toys at home. That very often it was the school was helping the family just survive. And so he was genuinely appreciative of being given a tool, being entrusted with this tool. And so if you really ask, why are the kids spending more time? It has to do with we're valuing them and we're validating them. You give a kid a $700 iPad, and you say, well, you're surprised that they do their work on it. No, they, you value them. You give a kid a smartphone, you're valuing them, and they know it. And they say, OK, if you value me, then I will do the work. I will do the work for you. Because it's different. If you ban this, which is what they, most schools do, they tell the kids, you're bad. What you do is bad. And the kids say, uh, I don't think I'm bad, but you're telling me I'm bad, the hell with you. And I'm not going to listen to you at all. Because you know kids, you, they'll turn off, they'll absolutely turn off if they think that you're not trusting them. And all this is, I think what's going on is that it's really a deep, deep inside that we're trusting the kids. So what we have seen is an actual cultural change. And the change is from this I teach, which is, You've got your books, your textbooks, but the teacher has always been the keeper of the information. It was the teacher who doles it out. You go into class so that the teacher can give you the correct answer, and you're just hungry. You're sitting there waiting. I teach model to the model that we're seeing where the students are finding the information, they're finding the answers, and what they need their teacher for is to mediate, to help them assimilate the knowledge, put it all together, and that's where we get the, 
we learn. We have seen that change. And in Singapore, that particular teacher with no science training came up immensely. She learned as much, if not more, than the students did. Now we have a very confident teacher. So all of these 34 programs where we're spending money, you want to make teachers smarter? Make kids smarter. <laughs> so the other thing that they're doing is part of that cultural change is throwing out all of the silly nonsense about memorizing rote facts. I was just reading the, the Future of Physics. I don't know how many of you read it. Um, Keiku, the, the quantum physicist, read it. And what he was saying is that by 2030, everyone will have the Internet either on their contacts or on their glasses. So you better start figuring out what you're going to test children on instead of rote facts, because they're going to have all of that. So you better be prepared and they better be prepared for questions that involve reasoning. And this is not hypothetical. He said, you know, he's talking to the, to the people who are actually creating this as we speak. And he explains the difference between if it's on your contact, how it works, and if it's on your glasses, how it works. It comes, it w it's actually easier to put it on your contact than it is on your glasses. But it will be there by 2030. That's not that long. So the content is changing. If you think about what you have to teach these kids, and you got to think about the textbooks, right, all these textbooks, what's going to happen, what's happening now is school, California, you guys, have said you're not going to buy textbooks. Do you know what a cataclysmic change is about to happen because of that statement? Texas is about to do exactly what California said. We're not going to buy the textbooks. All these companies, Pearson, McGraw-Hill, Houghton Mifflin, all of them make textbooks. And so what's about to happen is going to be a complete 180-degree topsy-turvy change. Now, you can say it started in California, it started in California. But simply saying we will not buy textbooks is going to change everything. So when we look in the schools, we, if we just look at the technology versus the pedagogy, the model. Two, two basic forms of pedagogy. Uh, you've either got the supplemental or the essential. And technologically, you've got a shared model or you've got one-to-one. -one. If you've got shared, then all you can do is supplemental because you can't do one-to-one. -one. And shared being the carts, the carts of laptops, the carts of, uh, of iPads. What we're seeing now are schools going out and buying a cart of iPads, and they, they, it looks like that. It's a charging cart so that it's got the power and everything. And they're spending 700 times 30, and they're buying a cart. Now, a cart of laptops did nothing to improve student achievement. Why would a cart of iPads improve student achievement? It won't. We're going to spend, we're going to see schools spend a tremendous amount of money now. There is rough, people say roughly, $9.8 billion of money left from the, uh, 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 the, uh, E2T2? The E2T, but when Obama came in, uh, the Recovery Act, ah, the Recovery Act, ARA, there's $9.8 billion unspent, and it has to be spent by September of 2011. Apple is just, just lining up and taking orders because schools are buying these carts. And you know what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen. Nothing. So if we've got one-to-one, -one, what we've seen in the past is with one-to-one, -one, they're still doing supplemental. That's why the programs were failing. But you can get the gold standard. When you've got one-to-one, -one, you have the ability to use it as an essential tool, to really make use of it, to let students create to create their own learning, to create their own understanding, like all of these children are doing, in school and outside of school. Go back one, go back one. No. no the, the laptop, talk about Irving, I mean, oh. the Irving story. I, I, mean, I live in Irving, Texas, and it, it's a laptop community. And all the time, I hear still students saying, do we have to bring them? Do we have to, are we going to use them this week? Do I have to bring it? What a waste of technology. What a waste of funds. You've got this tool. and. Do I, do I even have to bring it to school with me? Oh, besides, I know you have extras, so I don't have to. I don't have to wag it. 
So the point is, if a kid asks, do I need to bring the laptop, that means they're not really using it. And if they're not really using it, they're, if they're using it, they're using it as a supplement. And again, it's not going to improve student achievement. So why go through this? Now, you're starting to see schools buy iPads for each and every kid. And you're starting to see stuff saying iPads will improve reading skills, read performance. iPads will improve uh, math performance. When you give a kid, each kid, a device, and they use it substantially a lot, of, a lot of the time during the class, and the curriculum is about creating, darn, test scores are going to go up. Whether it's an iPad, whether it's a laptop, whether it's a smartphone, it doesn't really matter. It will improve test scores. It will improve student achievement. But how on God's earth can you scale a $700 computer? It, it, it won't scale. See, in schools today, you can go to any school district and you can make a difference. It's, that's not the point. It's got to be. And remember what, what Diane Ravitch said. Charter schools are not going to make the difference. There's about 15% of the kids in America are part of charter schools. 85% of the kids in America go to public schools. If you put your energy in the charter schools, which a lot of people do, that's okay. You're only hitting 15% of the kids. The lion's share, they're not doing anything about. And that's the mistake that she's pointing out. Similarly, similarly, you, I mean, yes, you can get $700, give them $700 computers. They love it. The kids are going to love it. It can't scale. So um, <laughs> I, I do have to go back. I want to show this because it's so good. <laughs> Uh, just uh, where is this cursor? Oh, 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 sorry. There it is. Okay, the school, I was in this school on the right about two weeks ago. Over in the corner is the teacher talking, right? This young lad is looking out the window. This young lady has nothing on her desk. She's sitting back staring at the these kids are slouching. This young lad has got a, a cell phone, a smartphone. He's, he's puttering away on it. And these two kids got their heads down. I don't know what the hell they're doing. And she's up there talking. Now, <laughs> this is what goes on in a school? What chance, what chance do you have for any education? Okay. So let me end by saying, whoops, I keep going over there. this. How are we going to scale? How are we going to make a difference in schools? In five years, is that Wagar Middle School going to look the same? And God only knows the answer is probably yes. In five years, what is industry going to look like? Well, we have the automobile industry, right? I mean, from Michigan, so you got the automobile. Now the automobile industry looks like that. It's all robots. And it's only going to get more. But if you look at the schools, that's the old days. This is Wagar. And five years from now, it's going to look the same. And <laughs> Chicken Little was right. The sky is falling. How can schools not make a change if we really want to, to get kids ready for the 21st century? And this is not just America. This is all over the world. The kid, you go, we each have friends in the UK. They're dying in the schools over there. The money is just getting creamed in the schools. In the UK, they were about to rebuild every one of the secondary school buildings because school buildings are important. They're community centers. They're going to put billions of pounds into rebuilding the schools. It's all gone. They've cut it out completely. There's no money. What's going to happen? And so the question is, is what is going to happen in five years? Well, we're, we still believe. In four years, <laughs> every student, every grade, every school is going to use this. How is this going to happen? Well, it's going to happen because bring your own device. Bring your own technology. Do you want to explain this one? Go ahead. No. Okay. It really doesn't matter. There are millions of problems with this. But the only way we're going to achieve one-to-one -one is if schools say, kids, bring what you got. And for those kids that don't got it, we'll take care of it. If that doesn't happen, in five years, we will see an America producing 
producing more than 80% dropouts, more than 50% dropouts, it will be, it will be a problem. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. We have questions? Time for a few questions? Yes, sir, Dan. I have a question, of course. Um, one of the trends, uh, in addition to the general collapse of the populist form, um, one of the particular trends I'm interested in is your thoughts on um, decisions by schools to remove the Linda Bader defund the library. Oh. The question is, is, schools are defunding libraries and defunding librarians, right? They're the ones that are getting kicked out. What's going to happen when you do that? Well, in our argument, our argument, the role of the teacher is to help the kids find the information and synthesize an understanding. Who, but better, but the library folks, to help the teachers learn how to do that? If they're not there, what is going to happen? You know what's going to happen. The teachers won't know how to do it. They won't be able to help the kids. And the kids will be out there looking for stuff, and they won't be successful. So it is a real problem. Yeah, except that the students are getting much better at finding information themselves. If you give them tools, it's amazing. I mean, we don't give them enough credit. <laughs> of, of the fact, yes, yes, we, we saw it. We it saw is. that, that very thing. Because part of the, the deal in Singapore was the children had free exploratory, uh, exploratory period. They had exploratory time, again, because they had their, th their devices 24-7. And it was amazing what they did that was outside, things that they were going that were tangentially uh, associated with what they were learning. But it was... It was just, you know, a slight add-on, slightly associated. And they went out and found amazing information. But it's still a problem. Themselves. It's still a problem. It's still, we, we disagree on this one. <laughs> we disagree. Yeah. Yeah, but I've been in public school. You haven't. <laughs> uh, how much do you know about the Chromebook operating system? Not enough. We, were so, we saw a this morning yep. okay. and the, the idea of the low-cost rental fees. Yeah. Sure. The question is, what about the Chromebooks that are coming out, the low-cost rental fees? How are they going to impact schools? And I, the, the, the fact that you are providing sort of Internet access via the cellular is very, very exciting. And that it's low-cost. Because that's the biggest that's the biggest problem right now with cellular is getting low cost data plans. It seems like the carriers do not understand that there are 55 million children. Like, there's not enough customers out there. They can't drop that plan. And the, the, it's interesting. Uh, we're we're at the there's a convention in San Francisco this week uh, the, the now called the Software Industry Information Association. And the subscription rates. How much were they typically per kid? Ten to twenty dollars per kid. So, but that was books. per year yeah. for books. You're wanting 20 bucks per month, so it's a little more. I mean, it's a little more, but it's still within range. Honest to God, it's in within, within range. Mm -hmm. So that price point is a good price point. Yeah. I think you're going to see success. Now, okay. Other question. Ha, 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 ha. You value it less, right? Yeah. No. No, no. No. But that's still, you know, if you think about it, right, no. Um, that sounds like something I would have said. <laughs> thank you. See you, Dan. <laughs> the, the, um, uh, the problem in schools is the person who buys it isn't the person who uses it. <laughs> so the, the superintendent and the principals, they're going to buy it, and the kids are going to use it. And the kids want this. They'll take a netbook, or they'll take a Chromebook. They will, <laughs> of course. Sure, they'll take it. They'll take it, especially if they've got cellular connectivity. Yes. Because you know, what good is it if it only works, uh, you know, on campus, in in these particular rooms? If they can portability, just trumps everything. If they can be any place and be doing it, it's just wonderful. So make it as lightweight as possible. You know, four pound uh, Chromebook is not so nice. A two pound, a two and a half pound Chromebook, much better. Or is it 
seems like the seven to ten thousand dollars a year for students is, is uh, if you went to a private school for four years. Absolutely. Years, and uh, ten percent of that for a device that you use for a couple of years doesn't sound like a lot of money. And uh, the you know libraries, I, I buy books on you know half off. I typically spend one four or five bucks a book. So you can buy for ten percent of that money on the order of seventy bucks a year for a kid, right? So there's an infinite amount of content out there for a reasonable fraction of the money. The devices are already cheap. It's an allocation problem, not a not enough money problem. It's a not enough money acceptable to be paid for this. Instead, we're going to pay for teacher development programs or something like that. And that's all motivated by the teachers' unions, which are they are going to benefit from the rights of the teachers, the benefits of the teachers provide a, a ladder for them to climb with the teacher benefit classes. That's exactly right. And in, uh, in New Jersey. Yeah, the, the question is, is, is it a question of not having enough money or is it just being poorly allocated? And New Jersey is a perfect example of that. They, they spend 13000 <laughs> per, per child per year. But only a fraction of that actually goes to instruction for the children. The rest of it is at all at the overhead involved in instruction for students. Though I would say that it's not just the unions. It is, you know, it's the fear of doing something different. And we work in Towns River, New Jersey, New Jersey. And what the superintendent did, he bought a thousand of these things. He said he wasn't going to buy textbooks. And that was a humongous decision that he had, he was brave. He said, I'm not going to buy textbooks. I want to buy these. Yeah, but again, I live in Irving and we do have textbooks. And what we do, <laughs> we spent $47 million on textbooks for children. And then we pay to warehouse them for six years. Because if you don't send them back to the state, uh, every one of them back to the state, you have to pay for them. So they don't want to risk giving them out to students who might lose them or destroy them and they'd have to pay for them. So they simply warehouse them all. They buy 125% of the allocation. The 25% goes into the classroom so that there's one on every desk. And then the 100% go to the warehouse and sit there for six years until they can send them back. But forty-seven million dollars worth. But what they do is, that because the publishing companies will give you one copy, electronic copy, if you buy a hard, a paperback copy. So that's why you have to buy a hundred percent of them. Because if you want an electronic one, you got to buy a paper one. But they put the paper one. They rent space at one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a year to rent space to store them. This doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. This is what goes on every day in schools. That went question back. No. That's certainly a problem. You've got to have good software that's learner-centered design that's for the students and for the teachers, and then the professional development to help them use it. Absolutely. So I think I'd like to combine these two questions. Okay. have a broken model when the, where the idea is that uh, somebody makes software and then we buy it over and over again for each kid. Mm -hmm. Instead, the schools have money that can commission the development of software, software and, and content that is in the public domain. I will pay you $40 million to write a textbook that goes into the public domain and stays there for free. Not I will buy $40 million worth of textbooks. Right? And you will find that the, the ratio of money that goes to the publishing companies for the production of textbooks author for the creation. I don't know. Authors make uh, on the order of 10% or less. Mm -hmm. of That's the right. Money. So you can create 10 times as much content if you directly commission its, its production and just put it in the public domain. Except that states don't typically work that way. You know, they might do it in the public domain for Texas, yes. but they don't do it in the public domain. UCCP, University of California College Prep, made all these AP courses, which they then licensed for a fee to non-California. Yeah, right. right. There we go. It's amazing. Yeah. This is called America, and they're not even sharing. And, the, you're, and how many science, earth science textbooks for seventh grade do you really need? 17 different ones? No. It's still plate tectonics, by and large. So you're right. But, it's, but that's not a model we have. It's, it's not a model we have. It's, it's not a business model. So it's not the hardware. It's not the software. It actually has a lot to do with 
What is the business model? Take anything like 1% of the money collected for a student and put it into the conditioning of free and open source material, we'd be flooded with software. So like you wouldn't have any collaboration. Well, Wikipedia, right, is one of the five largest access sites on the internet. What's, what site is banned in schools? Wikipedia. Because it's not a valid site. Because they're, they're petrified. It's free, it's open. And YouTube, and YouTube, that's, YouTube. Right. And YouTube. that's right, and YouTube, right. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, second, the second largest search engine. <laughs> it's great, they ban it. Actually, we work in schools, some of the schools, the filters ban Google. Can't even get to Google. Well, because they tie it down. I mean, you know, they're so afraid. The so students afraid. are going to access something that they shouldn't, that they just lock everything down. Because And sometimes it, it pushes it down so far that they can't even search. They're petrified of being sued. That's what the superintendents are. They're absolutely petrified of being sued. And so, cut it out. So actually, what you were saying is that the children in Singapore did have software that they could use for creation. And, and that was, the software is, in fact, what is making the difference. If you give them some tools. Yep. These are good discussions. And, 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 and people need to... People need to talk about it because it, it's it's not obvious what to do. I mean, it's but if we don't do something, my God. I mean, you guys are successful. I mean, we're successful. I mean, golly, Moses. But 80% dropout? This is America. America. Say good night. Good night. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>